I'm Marie Granaroli. I'm Angelo Granaroli, and we live at 1390 Casitas Pass Road, about three blocks from McDonald's. <laughs> However, we're not in the city. Well, the first question is, uh, there was a question in our CARP quiz game about uh, beachfront homes being damaged. Do you mm -hmm. recall what happened back then? It, was yes. it in the 30s? It was in the 30s, and I gave you the wrong date. It's actually 1939. And I got that confirmed by a couple of my high school friends when I had lunch with them. And, um, and, and so what happened? How were the beachfront homes destroyed? Uh, by a southeastern storm and the huge waves that took out several beach houses and then there were some that were not that they were partially destroyed but they were moved around in different spots in Carpentria and those are still still around hmm. made into homes and, and where did this take place along Panera Lane Sandy Land and do you have any idea why it occurred because of the southeastern storm. Now my understanding was it also had to do with them building um, a breakwater for Stearns Wharf at that time and it changed the currents. Do you know anything about that? Well it, it took away all the sand from, from the local beaches and we had nothing but rocks, big rocks, so it, it reduced the shoreline back in uh, whether the breakwater had anything to do with it, I'm not sure. And did it take a while for the sand to come back? Once, once the harbor started filling sand itself and let the sand come back down toward Summerland and Carpentaria, we got our beaches back. But that took several years. Marie, did you but, want to add to that? Well, also, we haven't had any southeastern storms for a long time. I mean, when I was growing up, it seemed like every winter it rained and it rained and it rained and the creeks would overflow. And this just doesn't, hasn't happened for a long time. And uh, when a southeastern storm does come, I mean, those waves get huge. And it's... They used the waves used to go all the way up to the railroad tracks. Really? L yes. Like by Padaro Lane, you mean? Or? Yeah, well, on Linden Avenue. Oh, the water has come up to, li up to the railroad tracks, yes. On Linden Avenue, yeah, yes. Yes, we've seen, we've seen that. Well, there used to be a slough there on 3rd Street. That was all water. A slough, there weren't homes in, in there. That was after the war that the homes were built. Was the slough filled in on 3rd Street to build the homes? <laughs> Yes, yes, it was, there were, one night, wasn't it night, that there were several um, carryalls went down to the beach, and got all the sand. Several what? Carryalls. The carryalls. Carryalls, they came, went down to the beach and dug the sand out and dumped it into the slough, which was illegal. But it, he went ahead and, and it got done, and then the houses started be being, being built on it. That's where on Third Street there were all these cement brick cottages. Like Ted, Ted Canfield was the contractor at the time. And when you say several carryalls, what is a carryall? A gray that picks up the sand and carries it carries it to where you want to dump it. You see, you've seen him work on the freeways. The earth movers is oh. what they oh, earth movers. Uh, or a bulldozer. No, well, not bulldozer, no. but they're earth movers. They pick up the ground and haul it wherever you want. Well, after that occurred, then an ordinance was made or introduced to prohibit taking sand and using it for that purpose. Now you're not even supposed to go down and get a box full of sand. But they used to take sand and to use um, for Children's little play yards. Sandboxes. Sandboxes. Yeah, everybody had a sandbox sand because it was available. But you can't do that anymore. What was the neighborhood like back uh, towards right by the beach when it was first developed? What, now uh, it's it's kind of more becoming more exclusive of uh, having a home right on the waterfront. Where was it as valuable then to be close to the water? Well, yes, but 
there weren't that many there. They were only along Sandyland Cove, Padero, and along Sandyland right off of Linden Avenue. There were probably th maybe three, four vacant lots, but otherwise there were homes. Most of those now have been replaced by apartments. They weren't permanent residents, were they? Were just, no, they, they were, were mainly they were, summer, summer, summer vacation cottages. And uh, Fish Beach Camp was down there, and people came up and camped in that area. And yeah, they camped along where the state park is. Mm -hmm. Now, the, Fish Beach Camp, I, I believe the fishes were related to Ralph Brown's family. Yes. Is that right? yes. Was the Fish Beach Camp in the same place where the state park is yes. now? Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. And what was it like then? It was, it was the Carpenter Auto, what did they call it? The Carpenter Auto Camp? No, or Carpenter Beach Auto Carpenter. Carpenter Beach Camp. Yep. Man, we call. I mean, the locals called it the fish camp because the fish. they owned it, and and they had, on the right hand side of Linden, they had a store, down there that you could buy stuff, for the campers could buy stuff and the kids could go in and get popsicles and stuff to drink, and uh, we spent a lot of time down there. It was a bathhouse they called it where they had dressing rooms, and uh, then they rented. The, the camping space. There were maybe three or four cottages too that they rented. But now, I, I know that I was too young to go stay. There were some family friends from Canoga Park that would come and camp and uh, I was allowed to go down there during the day and spend the days, but I couldn't stay all night because I was too young. Hmm. But my brother got to do that because he was older. The beach, the beach was operated by the county and not then, honey. It was not until it after the operated by the county, and then the county got tired of figure they couldn't afford it, and they turned it over to the state. state. Yeah, but that was after the fishes. Yeah. Now, when people camped back in the '30s and '40s, uh, was it mainly just tent camping? Did they have motorhomes no. and that type of oh, thing? No, no, there weren't motorhomes. There were just tents. The, the, the parents slept in the tents and the kids slept out, outside. That's nice. Yeah. Um, do you have any idea how much homes cost in the 30s and 40s? The first house my folks bought in Summerland, they paid uh, $15 down and $15 a month and I think it was $1,500. The total price was fifteen hundred dollars, yes. and, and about what year would that have been? No, oh, that was in nineteen thirty-four, thirty-five. Wow! So, have you seen prices go up over the years? Oh, okay. yes, it's ridiculous. We it's bought ridiculous. We bought our first lot at Serena Park, which is near the polo field, for uh, I think it was fifteen hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and that was a half an acre. That was. And then we bought um, a little oh, 20 by 20, 20 building. building and had it moved in there and made a house out of it. Added on. How, added much, on. how much do you think that half uh, acre property is worth today? Oh. <laughs> 800, uh, 900,000, maybe yeah. a million. Could be a million by now. We sold, we sold it for 16. Sixteen thousand. Uh, yes, and th thought we were really doing well. <laughs> and, and what year was that in? Oh, fifties. Fifties. Yeah. Uh huh. And we have a piece of property on Third Street, which is one of the cement brick houses, and that we paid twelve thousand for. In what year about? Oh, probably in the fifties. And that now is worth over a million. So is it, is it, do you like the, the fact that prices are going up? Well, in, in a way, but, uh, you know, it, I feel sorry for the younger generation trying to get established in Carpinteria because things are just so expensive. Uh, and actually for what we paid for that property down on the beach, the capital gains, we can't afford to sell it. Hmm. They'd take half of it. 
Uh, did you think over the years that prices could never go higher, but they keep going higher? We never really gave it a thought. You don't think about it when you yeah. purchase property, about it going up. And it's, it's been helpful to us in a way because it helped with putting our, uh, one of our granddaughter through in college. Nice. When my, our theory was to invest into property. And at one time we had five houses downtown in Carpinteria. And then when the opportunity came to buy this ranch, we utilized selling those, some of those properties to get this ranch. And uh, tell us, what do you do for a living? I raise avocados. I've been a farmer. I've worked for other people for 25 years and made money for them. And then after 25 years, figured out I better start making it for myself. <laughs> And uh, do you work with him, Marie? Oh, yes. Yes. And I've been a bookkeeper all my life, and, uh, and I take care of the books. I had to go to learn how to run a computer and went to Santa Barbara High School where they had a program uh, for people to learn how. Yeah. And I didn't even know how to turn one on when I started. You know, she's, the, she's the backbone of this company. <laughs> <laughs> And do, do you do other things on the computer now in addition to finances? Oh, I, I do over the internet and we, we have a rental up at Mammoth Lakes and, and we advertise on the internet and uh, so I handle that. So you're probably one of the few people over 50 or 60 that uses the internet. Would you recommend it to other senior citizens? Sure. Yeah, it's very, because you can contact people if you have relatives in other states, it's nice to be able to just get on the internet and uh, communicate. I use it too in my business. If I need a part for a tractor or something, rather than going to the local merchants and try to find it, which usually it's impossible, I get on the internet and it can be here in two or three days. And Do you mind if I ask you how old you each are? We're both 82. Good for you, 82-year-olds using the internet. I like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, we enjoy it. It's, uh, I get in and play uh, games on it, and it's relaxing. Do you email at all on the internet? She, I do. she does emailing, yeah, I don't. Uh -huh. Do you have a MySpace? A what space? MySpace? No. Okay. No. <laughs> I'm a <laughs> not that far advanced. <laughs> I'm not into a lot of things on the internet. I'm just into <clears throat> checking checking my emails and, and sending emails and, and getting on to find And making your payroll checks and so yeah, forth. And so I on. use it for the in the business. Mm -hmm. Um how did you get into uh, ag, the ag business? Oh, when I was in high school, I used to drive tractor on the Flashman Ranch, which is at Lambert Road. I'd get on the tractor after school and work till 10, 11 o'clock at night and uh, enjoyed it. I had a great uncle who was foreman of the ranch. Then I went in the service and did a few odd jobs and uh, got into a problem with the union and I decided, well, I don't need anybody to tell me what to do. So <coughs> agriculture, I was free to do what I wanted to do. And were you working with avocados when you were working for others? There were a few avocados on the ranch when I, when I worked there, but they weren't as popular as they are today. I mean, it, it's taken years to develop the market for people to enjoy avocados for health reasons and other things. And it's, it's, uh, it's amazing how it's multiplied. So that's interesting. People didn't always eat many avocados. Mm. And you had to help develop the market? Well, the yeah. Local the growers Companies did. developed the market. But the variety at that time, they were very thin-skinned. And you couldn't ship them very far because they would bruise. And they, you know, they weren't worth eating. And uh, with, the, with the development of the Haas avocado, which has a, a fairly thick skin, can handle the shipping 
time that it has to travel to get to the people in the stores. Hmm. And uh, do you have kids or grandkids? We have two children, um, a boy, a son and a daughter, and they both are fortunate enough to live in Carpinteria. Our daughter works up at Kate School, has been there for 20 some years. And uh, our, the, we have four grandchildren, they each have a boy and a girl. And uh, my mother was born in Carpinteria. She was born across from the polo field, which is, would be on Padero Lane now. And uh, there's a street in Carpinteria named Ogan Road. My grandmother was an Ogan. Uh -huh. And uh, my mother's maiden name was Martin. Um, but was your family also involved with Shepherd's Inn, which was up yes, by Shepherd's Mesa? Yes. My, my parents went there in 1922. Uh, with, my dad was raised uh, by his older sister, who was Marie Solari. And um, she bought this ranch, which was Shepherd's Inn. And where was it? It was on a, the Ventura County line, where Santa Barbara and Ventura County line, off of Gouinador Road. And they ran the inn for a couple of years and then went into farming. And, and what was the inn like? Well, it was several buildings and there were cottages. People stayed in cottages. And in the inn, when I was little, we used to go and roller skate in the dance hall, in the dining room. There was a player piano there. I had lots of fun playing that. Uh, we used to hide in the ice boxes, which <laughs> is not the right thing to do, but they were those big old ice boxes. Could, could you open them from the inside? I don't recall. I don't recall. I doubt it. <laughs> so we don't recommend to that to anybody no, today. No, <laughs> we sure yeah, don't. No, but and, it originally it was a stagecoach stop. Uh huh. The people when they traveled Casitas Pass Road by stagecoach between Santa Barbara and Ventura, why well, they would stop and a lot of them would spend overnight. So I guess before um, Highway One and the freeway were built, you couldn't come right up the coast. No. Oh That's no! Right. You had to go back to the you back had to country. Go over yeah. Casitas Pass. Yeah, and the, there were times originally with the stagecoach, when they tried to get to Ventura, the tide was too high, so they couldn't travel the beach route. Do, that was before your time. Huh? Yes. Yes. Oh, That's yes. before our time. <laughs> yeah. But I, I had lots of fun playing in those different cottages. Now, Shepherd's Inn, I understand, was very popular uh, for, for movie stars, too. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, there's quite prominent names in the registers, which uh, we turned over to the Historical Society. Like who? Oh, dear. Herbert Hoover was one of them. Well, yeah. Huh. The president. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know whether Clark Cable or Carol? Well, that was, no, that was, it was before their time. Oh, okay. Before their Charlie time. Charlie Chaplin or? Yeah, it would be his era. Uh, it would yeah. be his era. Uh, yeah. But they came, a lot of them would come from Santa Barbara, too, to spend the night or the weekend. And everything was fresh. They'd even, if somebody ordered a trout, they'd go down in the Rincon Creek and catch the trout. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Were there also vegetable gardens? There? Oh yes, there were vegetable gardens, and they were very famous for their uh, baked oranges. Huh? Did they taste good? I don't know. Never, t never <laughs> tried <laughs> one. Never tried. <laughs> <laughs> we like them fresh. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, let's see. Um, <clears throat> um, can you tell me what schools you went to uh, in your youth? I went to the uh, main school which was a two-story with ivy over it, and that was where the, uh, now the community swimming pool is, and it was condemned, and in 1937 and 38, I went through the seventh and eighth grade mm -hmm. in tents, and they were like the army tents where the sides would roll up. We had an oil little stove for heat, uh, we had like regular tables that were covered with paper for our desks. 
uh, we all had little gardens outside of our tents that we kept. Huh. Uh, well, just to learn how to garden or to yeah, use for yeah, food? Yeah, for flowers or vegetables, just a little lesson in gardening. Keep, keep the youngsters busy. And also, we would be excused a lot of times because if the wind blew too hard or it rained too much, why, we were sent home. Because you were in tents. Because yeah. we were in tents. And then the main school was built. And is, so, is, is that where main school is today or a different main school? No, the main school where it where is, is today, today is where is not where the old school was. The old main school? No, no. We were along on Palm Avenue. Those tents were set up going from like where the pool is now down to whatever that next street is. But that's where we were lined up to, the, there were two rows. Caddy, of, cor Caddy Corner to Main School. Yeah, there were two rows of the tents. And the, the office building was more wooden structure. And that was moved out to the Boy Scout House, which is now the Lions Park. And it has been uh, taken down, torn down. But it was used by the Girl Scouts as their Girl Scout House. Hmm. And, and, and then I... Well, yeah. uh, and Angela, where did you go to elementary school? I went to school in Summerland. We had uh, two rooms. The teachers taught, one teacher taught uh, first grade to fourth grade, and the other teacher taught fifth grade to eighth grade. And then uh, we, I went to Carpenter High School. The bus would pick us up every morning and bring us to school. And was the Summerlin School in the same location where the Summerlin School yes, is now? Yes, basically, yeah. It, it increased in size uh, probably twofold mm -hmm. since I've been there. And, and then uh, Marie? And I went to Carpenter High School after graduating from grammar school. And, and where was the Carpenter High School then? Where the middle school is now. It's a different building, though, then, huh? No, no, it's the same building. Is it they've, the same? They've remodeled it and they've added on to it, but it's the same, same school. And about when was that built, do you think? That was built, I would say, in the 30s, mm -hmm. maybe late 30s. Mm -hmm. No, early 30s. Early 30s. Wait, early, yeah, early, early 30s, because, yeah. yeah, it was the early 30s, maybe the late 20s. Angelo, uh, what was it like growing up in Summerland? Uh, did, was the relationship between Summerlin and Carpinteria different back then, or and what was life like? Well, there's no, I, I wouldn't say it's different. Summerland, there were 60 families, period. I delivered papers in high school, in the, while I was in school. In, uh, it was wide open country, and we could, we could take our 22s or BB guns and go out and shoot jackrabbits or whatever and we didn't have the restrictions that there are today because there weren't any homes there. I, I guess you also had direct access to the beach. There wasn't a freeway in the way, huh? No, the highway was there. Uh -huh. Yeah, the highway was there, but not, not a freeway. It was two lanes, you know, and it didn't take long to run across two lanes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we used the beach quite often. <clears throat> and we, we, uh, we did a lot of fishing. We had the old oil derrick piers when I was a youngster. We fish off of those. I've seen pictures of those oil derrick piers, and I believe those were, that was the first uh, offshore oil production in all of North America right there in yes, Summerlin. Yes, right. Uh -huh. yeah. What was that like? Well, it, they kind of messed up the beaches. <laughs> How so? With, with the tar and the oil that, that seeped, leaked out, and so forth. And uh, they would have maybe eight or ten derricks would be run by one engine, and they had cables running from one derrick to the other. And uh, as kids, we would get on those cables as they were going up and down and shimmy across. And if we fell, it was in the water, so that was part of our uh, fun. <laughs> I'll just see, I'm going to adjust this shot just a little bit. Um, 
Was it before your time in Summerlin when there was nat natural gas leakage on land and some people lit them and I understand baseball was played by it? Yeah, that's the first night baseball game was played. When my folks bought the house in Summerlin, we took a piece of two inch pipe and drove it down in the ground and piped it into our house. We used that for cooking and heating. So th this was natural gas? This that was, was natural gas. There was so much natural gas in Summerlin. Then after, when they built the freeway, they cut the freeway down so deep, all the gas escaped and it wasn't available to our, our little pipe anymore. Huh. Was it just your house that used it or did no, it was No, the other people in the, in the homes, yeah. Huh. I think there's some natural gas seepage also on Rincon Mountain and occasionally you see it flaring up and so forth. Yeah, Are there's a, what do you call them? Yeah, there, there's uh, hmm, some, some hot water and gases escaping on, on the Bates Ranch, even today. And once, once in a while it catches on fire, but uh, it hasn't occurred for 10, 15 years, I don't think. I remember reading that people used to think it was a volcano on Rincon Mountain, but the fires <laughs> came from the natural gas seepage. Yes, that right. That caught on fire. Uh -huh. That's yeah. funny. Yeah. yeah. When I was growing up, uh, I was able to, first I had a bicycle, and then I could ride my bicycle down to Carpenter to the beach, which today I'd hate to let my child do that because the roads are still kind of narrow and there's bicyclers out there on the roads and, I, and then i had a horse and that was great for me mm -hmm. i there were several other girls that had horses and we used to ride back in the mountains day trips take our lunch and our coca-cola but we always brought our bottles and our trash back with us we never left it over there and there were even sometimes that we stayed all night, one of the mothers would go with us. And another, an Easter week, we used to go up over the top of the ridge and back down into um, the, our blacksmith here in Carpenter, Dick Morris, had a cabin back there. And one of the fathers would take our supplies back in his pickup. Is this by the, the third mountain range? This is, yes, back over the top of the ridge and down in by the Hoonkow Dam. Uh-huh. And, and did you start off getting there by going up the Franklin Trail? Yes, we did. I know it's pretty exciting for our community that the Franklin Trail may be open again soon for mm -hmm. the community to use. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Yeah, that's how, how I use As it. long as they respect it. The big problem is people just don't respect it and they... Respect. Throw their trash all over the place. Yeah. You know, if if you, they take something like a can of soft drink, to take to with them, and, they, and when they finish it, they won't they won't carry it out. They just throw it on the ground. Well, there were, pe yeah. people ruin it. Yeah. There were streams back in there, two little streams. I mean, we would drink the water, think nothing of it. Hmm. Well, you'd ride your horses on the beach. Oh, I used to take my horse. Being at that time, I was able to ride it right out in the water, and ride on the beach because there weren't that many people. And one of my friends or folks did have a, a beach cottage on Sandyland Road, and they had a little corral and a hitching post. And even around town, there were hitching posts where yeah. you could tie your horse up to to go into the drugstore and have an ice cream soda. You mean like at Mills Corner? At Mills, that wasn't Mills then. Oh, before that, Mills Corner. That was before Mills. But, yeah. but there was a hitching post at Linden yes. and Carpentry Avenue. Huh? It was, yeah, behind the, what would have been the drugstore, was behind that. And the other one would have been on Woolbrant Way. There was a hardware store there, and that's where, the, because the Kate School was strictly uh, boys, boys, and they had to have a horse. And so on their free time, they would ride downtown and tie their horse up and go and shopping. Well, where did you keep your horse? Well, I had it at home. And where were you living then? Well, that was at Shepherd's Inn, the oh, property. Uh -huh. did, did people have horses uh, staying with them right in town in Carpinteria? They were not right in Carpinteria. They were on ranches. 
I see. They were mostly lemon ranches at that time. Mm -hmm. And that's what, it took me a half an hour to ride from home downtown. From, from up Shepherd's Inn, then, near Shepherd's uh -huh, Mesa uh -huh. to downtown. Downtown. Yeah, yeah a, lot of, a lot of the farmers all had horses. Uh, they used it to haul the lemons out of the, out of the orchards. And I remember on the Flashman Ranch, we had two donkeys, two mules really, and uh, they, we would haul maybe 30, 40 boxes out at a time and put it on the plant platform on the main road and the fruit company would come down and pick them up with a truck. Yeah, that's another thing that was fun when I was growing up was uh, Johnson Fruit Company well, and the other company, uh, lemon companies too, uh, there were lemon boxes, and whenever the pickers were there and the lemon boxes would be delivered, we'd go and make houses out of them <laughs> before the pickers got there. <laughs> that must have been fun. And that was fun. Like doll houses or houses to go into? Well, like doll. Playhouses. Play, like a playhouse. You'd just uh, put them on top of each other. The, they'd stack up, and, and you'd make a couple of rooms, and... It was just a fun thing, and of course, there weren't many children around. You know, my closest neighbor was at least a mile away. There was another girl that lived, and then I had twin cousins, the Baylor twins, and they were a couple of miles away. Can you each tell me what you did in your spare time, in your free time? You mean as growing up? Yeah, as, as kids living here in the Carpentria Valley. Well, very often in the summertime, there were picnics at the beach. There was, the, the tables were there. Uh, they were the cement tables. And the families would go down on Sundays. And also, we used to go to different, like over to Wheeler's uh, Gorge and picnic over there with well, family. Where is that? That's over towards Ojai. And also like up to Paradise Camp. That's up off of San Marcos. We'd do things like that, or go on a Sunday drive. Yeah, there'd, there'd be go. four and five families that would get together and, and arrange a picnic in, in, at these different places. And that, that was our pastime. I understand there was a clearing near the beginning of the Franklin Trail, uh, just south of it, that was a big picnic area. Do you know what I'm talking yes. about? Yes. <clears throat> I, I vaguely remember it because I was you know, too little. But they used to even have um, plays up there. I understand that. And uh, I guess it was potlucks or so, but I mean, it was, I vaguely remember it because it was, I was just too little. It, it was outdoor. Outdoors, yes. Yeah. yeah, I remember when it was in Cub Scouts, uh, our, our Cub Scout leader, we put packs on our back and we walked from Summerland down to Franklin Creek and spent a couple of nights there and it was our camp out as, as Cub Scouts. What was it like going to the beach with a friend uh, in your youth? Well, my mother could take me down to the beach and leave me because there were play directors. They were like college girls and they told stories and they took you, they, that's where I learned to swim. They gave you lessons and uh, and my mother would leave me, she'd go and play bridge, then she'd pick me up like at four o'clock in the <laughs> afternoon. And it was very safe in those days. Hmm. And there was also um, swings and... and uh, Teeter boards. Yeah. Angela, did, uh, did guys uh, surf and boogie board back in the near days? Well, not really boogie board or, or surfing, but we had paddle boards that that we made in shop at, at uh, school. And they did ride the waves with the paddle boards. They were about three inches thick and hollow. Hmm. And so they, they did float. In, uh, in Summerland, I only lived two blocks away from the beach. So we spent a lot of time there. Um, Marie, what did you do as a young girl? Did you play dolls with your friends or like 
Was it? Oh angel? yes, we played dolls and we played dress up uh, with clothes. That was lots of fun doing that. And um, did you do sports at all? Not like they do today. That we didn't have that. I mean, I remember we played hockey and I played some tennis, but there was never any inner with other schools. For the girls. For the girls. There was like play days where we go to, I remember going out to Goleta to their grammar school. We had May, we had May days. Yeah. We had and, the but, May poles where they would dance around the May pole with the ribbons and wind it around. I remember that. Mm -hmm. uh, where would the pole be? Well, it would be on the school grounds. Uh, we, and one year we'd go to Goleta, and one year to Montecito, and one year to Carpinteria. That was the Summerland group. Mm -hmm. um, Angela, what did you do? Did you play sports in your youth at all? Well, youth, yeah, I played in high school. I played football and basketball and track, so forth. Uh, but uh, were you on the football team at Carpentria High School? Yes. Uh -huh. well, I guess Carpentria High School when it was on yeah, Carpentria. Yeah, down here. Yeah. Do, yeah. do you know how football is different then than now? Uh, well, I, d I don't think it was <laughs> so much win, win, win. Hmm. I think it was the pleasure of competing in sports against another team. In win or lose, you had fun. Was the equipment somewhat different too? Or did you have less padding then? Well, hardly none. <laughs> huh. We had shoulder pads, and uh, uh, then we the first time we had leather helmets when I was a freshman, and then after that they got into the plastic helmets and uh, knee pads, thigh pads. We had. And then you went to six man. Because of yeah. the World War. War World War Two, we, we couldn't play. We couldn't travel, so we had intramural six-man teams uh, for our sports rather than competing with another school. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, do you recall what Santa Claus Lane was like in the forties and fifties? Santa Claus Lane was the Richfield service station, <laughs> and there was a big high uh, oil derrick tower there with the Richfield sign on it. Uh huh. And this was before the Santa Claus thing. Yes. Before Santa Claus even. That was after the war. Uh, yeah. But uh, McKeon. Yeah, June and Pat McKeon. June and Pat McKeon developed that area into Santa Claus, and it. It was a nice stopping place because between Los Angeles and San Francisco, there weren't that many gas stations, that many places where they could stop and relax. In the, in, in the 40s and 50s and 60s, it was very popular. And, and what was there? How was it? What? Well, he started out with the date shakes, uh, uh, made it malted, malted milkshakes with dates, and that was their trademark, so to speak, and then they got into a little restaurant and served sandwiches and so forth. Was there a Santa Claus there normally? Uh, not normally. They had a little train that would go around that, that the kids could ride. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Hold on one second. Yeah. I, this, I think battery just went. The cottage. And Mr. Kate would ride his horse down and have tea. Okay, and then when we, we lived on the Russell Ranch, which was Mr. Kate's son-in-law, he, I'd have him in for tea. One, two, three. Testing, 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 testing. And I can give you more history on that with our daughter and granddaughter. Um, okay, hold on. So let's pick it up. You, you were telling me about what's... Well, they had a little little train that go around in a circle and the kids could ride around. And I, I think they paid a dime or something like that. And Even I remember that in the 60s, I think. Yeah, yeah. uh-huh. Yeah, and then there was another restaurant that was built and, and then there was a 
uh, Toy store? hotel that was built down the motel, I should say, was built. It's now an antique shop. And uh, then as the cars got uh, better mileage, they didn't have to stop that many places, and it just kind of died. That's interesting. So part of the demise of Santa Claus Lane was uh, better mileage of cars. Yes, right. I guess there were also more gas stations along the route to San Francisco. Yeah. Mm hmm and the, uh, the McKeons, they, they built Santa Claus. And uh, June McKeon was quite an entrepreneur. She, she, she was very uh, artistic. And she, uh, she was also the one that developed the big yellow house. Really? Yeah, into a restaurant and uh, so forth. It's interesting how uh, individual people can change the uh, history of a little community by what they do. Yeah. Can you think of who other? Uh, can you think of other significant people in the, your history here in Carpentria that helped uh, affect the changes in town? Well, I, you know the the farmers worked together. Uh, mm. If if you needed to have something done and you didn't have time to do it. You, Two or three guys would go over and, and help you get it done. It, it was a, a very kind of, say, a tight-knit community, you know, and everybody had the same problems, and uh, they were very helpful. I, the, the story we have as far as getting this ranch is, is, a, is a fairy tale as far as I'm concerned. and, and uh, the, Your the, ranch here on Casitas this, Pass. This, this ranch here. Tell yes. me, tell me about what was the story? Well, it was I. I had leased the place from from a Dr. Graham, and uh, improved the property, and it was making a profit. So Dr. Graham decided to sell it, and there were four developers that were going to buy it, and they were going to resell it to nursery people and and. We didn't want greenhouses in the valley, so my neighbor uh, Bev Baylord and his wife Florence came over and offered to buy it for us with the stipulation that we could sell maybe one or two or houses in Carpentria and pay them, give them the money back for the down payment, and then we could make the payments out of the crop. Hmm. In, uh, through, through the grapevine, we found out that if Mr. Baylord and his wife hadn't have done it, there were other farmers that were willing to do that for Marie and I. Hmm. I, I guess over the years, there's been some uh, controversy between greenhouse growers and uh, field crop growers. Is that right? Well, well there's... Uh, the, maybe I should ask... Uh, it, <laughs> it's it's that, not a controversy. It, it's... it's the competition, I guess, for labor, which it has created. Because greenhouses, they work all year round. In agriculture, when it's rain and it's cold in the wintertime, there isn't that much work around. And that's where the competition has come. And also... Uh, how so competition? Competition to get workers? Labor, yes. Uh -huh. Labor. And the greenhouses cover the ground. When it rains, where does the water go? Before the greenhouses were here, it would go into the ground. Once the greenhouses are here, it runs off and it creates runoff problems. Hmm. But one thing the county has done is that it's, they haven't permitted the greenhouses to cover all their ground. They can only cover 50% of what they have. If they have 20 acres, they can only cover 10, and so on. So they kind of limited, limited them as to how much they could really produce. Do the greenhouse farmers tend to make more money than the uh, open field farmers? I think so, yeah. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in the business. I mean, if... Have you if, been tempted to do it at all, or...? I raised Yipsophila for two or three years and until the market got flooded. But it's, um, 
it's very labor intensified in in it's it's scientific farming compared to avocados and lemons and you've got to have the market the outlets and do you also kind of feel philosophically it's nicer to have ag that's open field than to have buildings on your ag land or do you have any feelings about that well we're making more people every day and they have to have a place to live there are other pieces of property that they could put houses on that are not agricultural viable, viable but uh, uh, that seems that though they want to go to the ground that's nice and flat and so forth and that's our agricultural land hmm. let's see uh, what was it like when the freeway was built and went through town how did people feel about it at the time I think we were glad to see it happen. <laughs> yeah. Why is that? Well, because of the congestion. The highway went right through Carpentry Avenue. That was the highway. And so there was less congestion in town when the freeway went through town. Oh, yes. 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 Oh, yes. Was, was there some discussion of having the freeway in a different location than right where it is now? Do you know? I oh, don't. I'm, I imagine there, <laughs> there were several there's plans, always somebody sure. that has a better idea. But, but was it uh, disruptive to the town, having some no. streets broken in half and so forth? Well, I think like Vallecito, yes, that was one that was broken in half. And that was probably the only one. But the town pe townspeople basically welcomed the freeway coming through. Oh, yes. yes. But now, now we're right back to where we were. If, like, if I want to mail a letter at 4.30, it takes me a good 10 minutes to go down to the post office, which would only take me two or three. So we have that congestion now and we need wider bridges because the town has grown. Same I'm, way with our freeway. We need more lanes. I believe there are some plans to make the bridges wider, uh, the one here on Casitas Pass, uh, in, in a few years, we'll yeah. see. Yeah, quite a few years, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Appropriating the money. You know, when, you, when you look at what they're doing to Ventura Creek, the money they're spending down there on that bridge, and here we are with two little bridges or three little bridges, and they can't touch them. Hmm. The money's all going down there. Hmm. Um, let's see. We covered most of what... Um, how did each of your families, uh, or I'll start over again. What led each of your families to come to the Carpentria Valley? Do you know? Well, mine, mine were, seemed like they were just raised here. Except my father came from New York when he was a young boy because his parents died. He was the youngest of 13 children. And he came to live with his oldest sister. Your mother was in born Montecito. in the beach. Your mother was born. And uh, that's how my father got here. And of course, my mother was born here. And, uh, but they did meet in Santa Barbara. Do you know what brought your family here? Uh, my family, my grandfather came from Texas, from Italy to Texas, and then Texas to Montecito. And my, when my dad, married my mother he was working for seaside oil company as a as a truck driver and seaside oil company's office was in summerland hmm. so we rented in summerland for years and years until the folks got enough money together to buy a house hmm. some people the ag industry brings people to the area and others uh the oil industry brought your family to the area and then you got into the ag industry yes mm-hmm yeah this, this property that we're on now is known as the Martin Brothers Track, which was my, would be my grandfather, would be my, my mother's father. And there were three, there's been three owners, different owners of the property until, until we, we were fortunate it. enough to get it. Just three, uh, start, yeah. starting how far back? 
Well, that would be back in the early 1900s. Yes. And, and who owned it before then? Okay, there was a, when I was Deacon growing up, Andrews. that was Andrews. Deacon oh. Andrews. And then uh, Walter Graham, and then we bought it from Wal Walter Graham. I mean, before Deacon Andrews, did, uh, did the mission no, system own no, it? No, it was the Martin Brothers. Oh, and right. the Martin Brothers sold out and went to the Owens Valley, and that was booming up there hmm. then. And it was the Los Angeles water that came along and took it away, and it folded up. And now they've just let water back into the Owens River. Hmm. And it's where, actually, I found out it's where Manzanar is. Right. There was a lot of history when we went, stopped at Manzanar, and I was reading uh, how it was a boom town in the uh, early 1900s. Hmm. Things change. Things change. So we'll see now when we go up, we're going up to Mammoth on Friday, and we will see the Owens River flowing. Do you recall when Carpinteria was incorporated as a city no. in 1965? I don't remember what year it was. Uh, and was it a big deal at the time? Do you oh remember? yes, they uh -huh. tried to, they tried twice to become a city and it was voted down. And the third time, the, the thing of it is the voting area, first time it encompassed the whole valley and they, they lost by so many votes. So then they encompassed a smaller area that they're going to turn into the city. Again, it got voted down. And then they took in the present day city boundaries and it got passed through. Did you have any feelings one way or the other whether you wanted the city to incorporate at the time? We hadn't. Well, we, we, we felt that we would have our own police force, so forth, and, and have a little better protection and uh, have a little better control of what would take place in our area rather than having all of Santa Barbara County make the decisions. Makes sense. Um, do you recall Circa Del Mar and what it was like? Yes. It was a beautiful dance hall and um, uh, they used to have, even like the 4th of July, that was always a big thing at the beach and uh, the dances. And then during the war, because then I was a teenager, and uh, the servicemen were stationed there and they had dances there for the servicemen, and I'd be invited to go to those. All the local girls were invited. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell me, um, can you either of you give any advice to youth today how to get ahead in the world? Ooh. What are your thoughts? It's a tough road out there today. And the thing is, they need an education, I would say, the first thing. Some kind, or, or a trade school to learn a trade so that they, they know what they could do. Even a, a woman needs that to fall back on in case she has to work. And you never know. Angela, you have any thoughts? Well, I, I've always been the theory that if you enjoy your work, work at it. If you don't enjoy the work, find something that you're going to enjoy and make life a lot happier for you and your family. If, you, if you're happy at work, the family's happy. Hmm. Good point. Well, thank you very much for this interview today. It was most informative. Thank you, thank you. and it, it's, it's been fun. Yeah. I, I, I think there's probably a lot more, many people in the valley that you should do this with. Okay, well, we'll look forward to that. Yes. Now, that's basically the end, but I'm going to see if I have any other questions. Um, what, what were some of the hangouts? Oh, did you say something you were going to say? No. Okay. No. What were some of the hangout spots in town in your youth? We had no hangouts, really, in, in Carton, Carton Rhea, yeah, except no. the beach house, the beach, and, and uh, the drugstore. But after dances, and when we were in high school, you'd go up to Santa Barbara to Elmer's on State Street. 
and that was the place to go. It was malt, the malt and, and hamburger hamburgers. place. <laughs> yeah, Elmer's. And I would say that's probably in the 1000 block of State Street. Uh -huh. That's where it was. And we, we would get together and, and carpool. I mean, instead of 10 cars driving up there, why, you know, we'd get everybody in four or five cars and drive up to Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. Can you think of any popular expressions or fads in your youth? Words or phrases you'd use? <laughs> No, not right at the moment. No, I can't think of any. It's okay. I, th I think you said fiddlesticks earlier. Well, the word, <laughs> you know, jacks, you know, I mean, like when you're in grammar school, you played jacks and you fiddlesticks. Well, what were fiddlesticks? They were like, like a toothpick, only longer. Oh, like, like a popsicle stick. Uh huh. And they were longer and they were um, in the shape of a toothpick. I remember and, that. And, and you just take them and lay them down and then pick them up without disturbing the rest of them until you got up as many as you could. And then the fiddlesticks became an expression, fiddlesticks? Yeah, fiddlesticks. Which means what? I mean, you, couldn't, you couldn't move one or the other. If you, you had them in a little bunch like that and you dropped them on the ground and they, you know, they would fall in different, and you tried to pick up the one on top so it wouldn't disturb another one. I remember that. Yeah. But what would you say fiddlesticks means today when you say fiddlesticks? Oh, it's an expression. You get maybe disgusted with something, an old fiddle. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Another thing, see, we grew up in the Glenn Miller era, the regular dance bands. And uh, that was a, a beautiful time because now we can't even understand if, what they're saying on some of these songs. <laughs> The music today is deafening. Compared to the good music we had. Um, what was date, what would people do on date? What was dating like back in your youth? We really didn't go out and date all the time like they do today. Uh, a date was to go to a dance, a high school dance, and we only had like, what, six of them a year? Mm -hmm. The big ones were the football banquet, and the other was the prom. And where did the dances take place? At the high school. In, in the, we had no other place to... In the gymnasium? In the gymnasium, the gymnasium, gymnasium yes. burnt, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was always decorated up for the theme. In other words, there was always a barn dance. Well, we would have a dance on Fridays, school. Oh, at noontime. At noontime. Yeah. With, yeah. A, with a photograph. And is there anything else you'd like to say or bring up any fond memories you have? I have lots of fond memories. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I was so lucky to, you know, be able to grow up in Carpinteria, even though it's grown to a big size, it can't stop progress. And I've been lucky enough to always live out to where I've never had a neighbor right on top, oh. close by, and uh, that's nice. Yeah. Any, do you have any thoughts, Angela? No, we 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 feel very fortunate to accomplish what we have accomplished together, and it it takes a lot of hard work of getting along. Um, one of one of our Theories is never go to bed mad with each other. Always have a good night kiss. That's nice. 